Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today we're going to start off with a chapter on pricing. That is chapter number 10 in your book. Right? But before we head on to chapter number 10, let's briefly discuss what we did in the previous lecture and we'll discuss the topic that I gave you for study as well. Right? So let's start. We started off with you, we were doing new product development step. We had done the first few step and we were down to marketing uh, strategy development. Now what happens in marketing strategy development is it essentially has three parts. So once you finalize on the product idea, you go for marketing strategy development. Marketing, marketing <coughs> strategy development has three important parts. The first part is referred to as description of the target market. You would try to define your target market, who are the people that you, you're trying to sell the product, then your profit goes along with your market share. Once you've defined that, based on that, you would want to price the product, distribute the product and do all the marketing budgeting. Once you're done with that, you move on to the third step of the marketing strategy development. That is defining your long-term sales, profit goals and marketing mix strategy. Now based on your marketing strategy, you would do the business analysis. The core aim of business analysis is to provide you with the information that whether the, pro the, the, the idea that you've generated, whether it's feasible to execute that idea or not. Is the cost benefit analysis in the right direction or not? So if the cost is more benefit less, that means you cannot go ahead with that particular project or with that idea. If the benefit is more and cost is less, then it's a good idea to go further through the steps of NPD. Once done with that, you go for product development. Product development is the phase where maximum investment take place and that's the place where you can physically see the product. Right? So physical transformation is done, engineering is done on the idea and now the idea would be in the form of product and you would be able to see what idea was generated. So engineering department, your R&D department does the product and development. Once you do the product and development, then it's time to test the product, test the water, see if the product would sell in the market or not. How would you do that? There were three ways through which you could do test marketing. But not all companies go for test marketing. If you're very sure that the product would be successful, you have a lot of knowledge about the market, and if it's a product that is a line extension, there's nothing new, that much new about the product that you're going to offer into the market, then it's a good idea to skip this particular step because it costs a lot of money to test the market. So what you can do is you can go ahead with full-scale commercialization. But if it's a product that you're not sure if it would work in the market or not, then it's a good idea to test the product. There are th three ways of testing the product. The first way is standard test markets. What happens in standard test markets is that you take representative cities, representative regions, representative area, and you launch the product in those particular areas. And you see if the product has been successful or not, how was the product received. If it was well received, it's a good idea to go for full-scale commercialization. Otherwise, drop the product's idea or the product there and then. You conduct the store audits, you, you know, do the surveys, and it helps you discover problems with the product. So since you're interacting with the real-time customer, the actual customer, they'll be able to tell you where the product is lacking, if there's a problem in its usage, if it's you know, packaged properly, <coughs> if the taste is good, if the, if the look is good, if the color that you've used are good enough. So you can get direct feedback from the customer. Secondly, you can also forecast the sales at a national level. So if you're launching the product, let's say in, pa uh, in Islamabad and Lahore, it would give you a good starting point for you to forecast how would the product do throughout Pakistan. Then you could also go for the second type of test marketing that is controlled test markets. In controlled test market what happens is that you pick and choose uh, the shelf spaces 
and you pay the uh, retailer for keeping your product onto the shelf and the customers come in and they buy the product and you see feedback of the customer. So that is controlled test market. On the other hand, the last one is the simulated test markets. Simulated test markets are those markets that are done, uh, is that marketing technique, test marketing technique which is done in the laboratory settings. So what you do is, in a lab setting you create a retail store, you pay people to go buy the product and they end up showing you how the consumer might behave. But the results might not be as convincing or as robust as in the other two approaches. Then in the very last step of NPD, you go for a full scale commercialization of the project. It is important to note here that during the commercialization project um, phase, you need to see where to launch the product, when to launch the product, and how much to launch it. Then coming down to new product development strategies. The first strategy is customer based customer centered new product development. What is that? Very good. Anybody else? The first point. This was your assignment. You mean English? English well, uh, we uh, look out uh, customer needs and wants and uh, try to fulfill their needs by, uh, by, uh, by managing new products, mm -hmm. giving them new uh, values and products. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Ma'am, I explained that your product is producing should be uh, revolving, should revolve around the beliefs and values of the customer. So it is customer oriented in their sense. Right. So customer centered new product development takes into account that the customer needs to be focused throughout the new product development, right? So the product is being designed for the customer, it is the customer who is going to buy the product. So the, all the process of the NPD needs to be customer focused. You need to take feedback from the customer, you need to include the customer when you are doing different processes of the new product development. Then there is a team based new product development. Then there is a team based new product development. Team based new product development is an approach whereby there are cross-functional teams that are created within an organization and the product is being developed through those cross-sectional teams. The previous idea was, the previous practices followed the sequential new product development. What happened in sequential new product development? Right, so each department used to work on the product and then it handed over the finished product to the second department. The second department used to finish the work and hand over the product to the third department, right? So this was how sequential new product development used to take place. But these days we are talking about team-based approach whereby you create cross-functional team. What is a cross-functional team? You take people from all the departments, they come together, form a team and as a result of which they create a product together. That is a team based approach towards new product development. It is very similar to the concept of matrix organization. What is a matrix organization? What is a matrix organization? A matrix organization is a, is a type of organization that encourages employee input whereby you, you include people from various departments. They work together on a single project, right? And the defining feature of new pro, uh, matrix structure is that there is double reporting in matrix structure. How would that take place? Now let's talk about matrix structure here. What happens is, let's say there's an ABC company or let's say there's comsets. Let's try to take the example of comsets. Now let's assume comsets is buying new laptops for every department. Now every department has its own needs, right? So finance people would have their own computing requirements, physics department would have its own computing requirement, management sciences department would have its own computing requ requirement. So if the procurement de department buys the product, if they buy the computers, they would not be able to know 
or they would not be able to recognize the different computing needs of each department. So let's say this is the structure. There's, this is the bio department. This is audit. This is management sciences. What you do in matrix structure is that you take people from all these departments and create a separate team here. And this team would procure the computers. Right? So you have representative from each department. Bio people would tell their requirement. They would tell their computing requirement. Audit, audit uh, staff would tell their and management sciences staff would tell their requirement. As a result of which the computers that would be procured would be as per need of each department. Now the defining feature in this matrix structure is that the person working here in this team would have two bosses. Right? So one boss would be the team head of this particular team. And the other boss would be the department that he comes from. So there's a double reporting that goes into a matrix structure. And that's how teamwork takes place in various departments. And that is the team-based new product development. So you have people coming from marketing department. You have people coming from finance department. You have people coming uh, from uh, you know HR department and they're all working together to launch the new product because they can all give their departments specialized information and contribution towards um, new product development. Now let's talk about systematic new product development. Systematic new product development takes into account that everybody needs to be taken on board. The new product development needs to be a holistic approach whereby employees are included, customers are included, suppliers are included. So you need to have everybody on board to create a new product. Because at the end of the day, all these people are stakeholders to the company. And all those stakeholders need to be on board so that systematic new pr product development can take place. And it also creates an innovate, a culture of innovation. So if you encourage your employees to put forward their idea, resultantly over the long period of time, the culture of innovation would come into being in your organization. You'll see that. Then we talked about PLC. What is PLC? Product life cycle. Product life cycle includes all the phases that a product goes through during its life time or life cycle. So distinctly there are four stages in product life cycle. There's introduction, there's growth, there's maturity and then there is decline phase. Now if you see here, this is the sales and this is the um, time. So if you see here, there's introduction, there's growth, there's maturity, and there's decline. If you see in the introduction phase, the profits are extremely low. The sales are extremely low. So if you see here, the sales are negligible, and the profits are negligible in the introduction phase. As the introduction phase passes, you enter into a phase of rapid growth. So if you see here, there's a steep increase in the sales and profit. That's where the customers become the customer become aware of the, your product. They know that this product is available in the shelves and they go buy the product. Once they're done with that, the, the product goes into the maturity phase. The maturity phase is the phase where you reach your maximum sales level. And this is the stage where the managers work to prolong the phase, right? So you could prolong the phase by modifying the product. You could prolong the phase by modifying the market or, or, or changing your marketing mix. So the three ways through which you could prolong your maturity phase. Maturity phase is the phase where you experience maximum sales. So how do you deal with maturity uh, stage? You modify the market, you enter into new markets so that your sales could somehow increase or you could maintain your sale. You could go for a slight change or twist and tweaks in your products or you could go for you know, heavy spending on your marketing mix. Then we talked about 
product life cycle and how it is applied to style, fed and fashion. So style is something which is a distinctive mode of expression, right? So it would be there. It would stay there for a long time. Sometimes when people follow the style, it becomes fashion. So fashion is fashion is a currently accepted popular style and fad is something that would come and go right so that would be fad a very short lived fashion would be fad so this was now let's start with chapter number 10 pricing understanding capturing customer value so what is price hmm? Okay, <coughs> they say cost is a fact, price is a policy. What does that mean? Cost is a fact, price is a policy. Policies can be made, can be changed. Exactly, so policies change, right? There are different ways of making policies, but the cost remains there. Right? So you cannot alter the cost as such. You can alter the cost, but the, you know, it's not something that you do very regular. But policy is something that you change, that you make. Right? So cost is a fact and based on that cost, you create a policy which is pricing. Now pricing is what? Pricing is the amount of money charged for a product or service. So some of all values that consumers give up in order to gain benefits of having or using a product or service is referred to as price. So you give a certain value to the customer. What is your value that you as a marketer would give? Hmm? The customer, the product that you give, the benefits that the customer gets at the end of the day by consuming your products, right? The hedonic benefit that you give, the Utilitarian benefit that you give to the customer, that is the value that the marketer gives to the end customer. On the other hand, what value does the customer give you? It's the price he pays for that product, the value that you give to that customer. So price is the value that you get from the customer when you give the customer some value. Now, if you see the four elements of your marketing mix, product, price, place, promotion. The price is the only element that, you know, brings in the money. The rest three, they only cost you money, right? So pricing is the only element that brings in the money and not takes the money away. So only element in the marketing mix that produces the revenue is pricing. Now, the different factors that you need to consider when you're pricing a product. The first thing that you need to consider is price ceiling. Now, what would be price ceiling? A price ceiling is referred to as customer value. If you set the price above the price ceiling, the customer would think that this product is not giving me so value and therefore he would not buy the, the customer would not end up buying the product so as per customers cost benefit analysis what would happen the customer would think that the benefit is less and the cost is more so that would result in they not buying the product so you need to set the price well within the price ceiling price ceiling is the maximum range of price that you can go for. If you go beyond price ceiling, the customer would think that they are being overcharged for the value that is being delivered. Right? So if you go to Serena and they charge you 30,000, people are willing to pay that much amount of money for one night because they think that the value they give is worth 30,000. Right? Imagine a situation where they charge 2 lakh rupees per night. Would the customer, the same customer end up buying the product? They might not because they, they might feel that the value that they're giving is not as much, 
right? So you need to set the price well within the price ceiling. On the other hand, there is price flow. Price flow actually refers to the cost of producing the product, right? So you need to set a price where you do not go beyond price flow. Price flow is no profits below this price, right? So product costs are usually your price flow. So if the product costs you rupees 10 and if you're charging them rupees 9, that means your pricing is below price flow. And that is also something that you would want to avoid as a company unless and until you have a you know, strategy. For instance, you, you, you're considering dumping. That is another um, topic. But for regular products, for everyday situations, you don't go below price flow, right? What is dumping? What is dumping? Mass sale of your product. Mass sale of your product. Anybody else? <clears throat> dumping is a strategy where companies sell their product below the cost. So the cost of, even the cost is not recovered during the process of dumping. But what they see is not the short term gain but the long term gain. So in long term gain, they will be able to drive all the competition out of business and then they would be king of the market, right? They, would, they can enjoy as much profit as they want. So China has done it. They offer products at an extremely low price. Why? Because they are able to, they see the long term gain and they want to rule the world, right? So that is price flow. So there are two considerations, two important considerations. The price shouldn't be above the price ceiling and the price should not go beyond price flow. And in between you have marketing strategy, objective, mix, nature of the market, demand, competitor strategies and prices. All these factors affect your pricing strategy. So for instance, if your competitor has dropped the price, you have to drop the price in order to defend your market, market share. If you don't drop the price, you will lose the market share to your competitor. So you need to see what the competitor is doing in the market. You need to see what is the nature and demand of your market. If your market is, is price elastic, then changing the price would have an effect on demand. If, an inel if it's an inelastic market, then if you change the price, it will not have an impact, right? So you need to study the demand for your product, the nature of your market, and then your objective, your marketing mix, your strategy. That also greatly affects your pricing, right? So for company who build, uh, who, who sell out luxuries, they cannot go beyond a certain level of price. We talked about Pochette Matisse in the other class. It is a LV product. Now what happens in, in Louis Vuitton products is they, t they do put them on sale but to a certain extent. If the product is not sold even on that price which is usually not there but if the product is not sold beyond that price level they do not reduce the price further. What they do is they burn all those bags but they don't go beyond a certain price level. Why wouldn't they want to do it? Why wouldn't? Exactly. So they, w they don't want to tarnish their brand, right? So they have a certain image of a luxury brand. What if their bag was available for $25, $30? That means it would not signify luxury in their brand. And that's what they want to avoid as a brand. So there are different factors that you need to consider. Now when you are pricing, there are generally two very broad ways of pricing your product. There is value based pricing and then there is a cost based pricing. Two broad categories of <coughs> pricing your product. What is value based pricing? Hmm? Okay. The difference between value-based pricing and customer-based uh, cost-based pricing 
is the fact that their starting point is different. So for value based start, uh, pricing, the starting point is customer value. You start with customer value and then you come down to price. Whereas in cost based pricing, you start with the cost and then you come down to now this is the difference between cost based pricing and value based pricing. Now if you see here what happens in cost based pricing is you design a good product, you determine the product cost that you incur on, on designing that product, you set the price based on the cost and then you convince the customer that the product you are selling is of good value. That's what happens in cost based pricing. But if you see here the value based pricing the starting point is different. You assess customer value, uh, you assess customer needs and value perceptions. So you firstly assess the value, then based on that value you set a target price that you would want to offer to the customer. Based on that target price you would go ahead and determine cost that can be incurred and as a result of which you would create value. That is a value based pricing. So you, f you would firstly try to identify the value that you would want to target and based on that you would come down to designing your product, right? So this is a value based um, pricing. So as, as, as the defined value based pricing uses the buyer's perception of value not the seller's cost as the key pricing, price is considered before the marketing program is set. That is value based pricing. Now value based pricing is of two types. The first type is called good value pricing and the second one is called value added pricing. Now good value pricing is a pricing technique whereby you offer an excellent combination of quality and price and that determines the value. So the cost and the quality needs to be in good combination to define good value prices. Now there are two types of good value pricing. There is EDLP, everyday low pricing and there is high low pricing. Now everyday low pricing is what you generally see in your grocery stores. So talk about Wal Walmart which is the king of EDLP, talk about Carrefour, talk about Metro Cash and Carry. What they say is we offer the lowest prices, right? That is EDLP, everyday low prices. On the other end there is a different strategy of giving value which is high low pricing. What happens in high low pricing? The things that are initially on the high price, for some time they go on low price. That is high low pricing. But in EDLP, the things remain on low price throughout the year. That's the promise of the brand. So there are two general uh, ideas when it comes to good value pricing. Offers the right combination of quality and good service to <laughs> fair price, right? On the other hand there is value added pricing. Now what happens in value added pricing? You don't reduce the price but you increase the features of the product, right? So what happens in value added pricing? Let's say your competitor has decreased the price of your product, of their product. What, what would you do as a company? you would not reduce the price of your product but you would convince the customer that this is the added feature that we are giving you and that's why you are charging them a certain price. So in value added pricing you convince the customer that the feature you, you are offering are differentiated enough for you to pay this amount of price. So you are convincing the customer that the combination of quality and price is better in our brand than the competitor's brand. A very good example given in your book is of an umbrella company, right? In, in the, in the Indo-Pak region, we have a monsoon season, right? And everybody needs umbrellas. Now there was a company in India that used to sell umbrellas. It was doing very well until the Chinese umbrella 
started coming in. And what did they do? They reduced the price so as to meet the price level of that Chinese competitor. As a result of which, what they saw was that their sales were dropping rather than increasing. So they changed their policy and they started following value added service. So they, added starting, uh, they started adding features to their umbrella rather than reducing the price of their umbrella. So for instance, uh, they, they added light to their umbrella. So if you're going at night, you could switch on that light and you know, go very easily. So this was a feature in their umbrella. So since they started adding features to their umbrella, you know, different colors, different textures, uh, different print, prints, um, different prints, different experimentation with the umbrellas. That's what they started doing. So they starting, uh, they started adding value to their umbrellas. Resultantly, they a they were able to sustain the competition. Not only sustain the competition, but to they were able to regain their market share. So that is value added pricing. <coughs> now coming down to cost based pricing which is the second way of pricing your product. We said there was value based. Value based was where the starting point was the value that you would give to customer and resultantly you would come down to designing the product of a certain target price. That was value added. On the other hand there was cost base. What happens in cost base is you produce the product, the engineering department would produce the product. Once the product has been produced, what would happen? You would know the cost of the product. Once you know the cost of the product, you would add a markup to that product. right? So let's say you need 20% profit on the investment that you've made. Based on that, you would calculate the price upon which you would enter into the market. And once done with that, you would end up um, you know, bringing the product into the market and convincing the customer to go buy the product. Now, in, um, when you're doing cost-based pricing, there are many important factors that you need to consider. One of the most important factor is economies of scale. We've done this before. Let's revise that. Now, the total cost is equals to fixed cost plus variable cost. Now, what is a fixed cost? What is fixed cost? Fixed cost is a cost that would not change with the number of units that you produce. So, executive salaries remain there whether you produce 10 units, 20 units or 10,000 units. You would have to pay the executives. The rent would not change, the heating, the cooling expense, that might not change, the interest payments that you, you have to make as a company, they would not change with the number of units that you produce. So that is a fixed cost uh, of a product. On the other hand, there's variable cost. The variable cost is the cost that would change with the number of units that you produce. So your raw material, the packaging that you use, it costs you more if you produce more product, right? So that is variable cost. And total cost is when you add a fixed cost and um, variable cost. And what would be average cost? Average cost is, a, is the cost associated with a given level of output. Now if you see in this particular graph, there is cost at different levels of production. Let's get back to the lecture. So we were doing total cost, variable cost, average cost. Let's talk about costs at different level of levels of production. Now if you see here, at 1,000 unit, the cost per unit is minimum, right? So that is where there is economies of scale, right? At 1,000 units, you're able to reduce the cost at the minimum possible level. So that is cost behavior in a fixed size plant. Now if you go take the production from 1000 units to 2000 uni units in the same plant, you would not be able to reduce the cost. Why would that be? 
Why would that be? Hmm? Because the, because of the production capacity, and if you need to increase it to 2,000, then you will, you will might need uh, more employees. You might they, the same employees could produce, but there would be waiting time associated with producing the product, and as a result of which, you could experience this economies of scales. What you can do if you want to reduce the unit price even further, you could go for cost behavior over different plant sites. So you could build a new plant. As a result of which, here you could see, here you could see at 2000 level, the price has reduced even further. At 3000, the, re the price has reduced even further. So at different levels of production, given that you've created a new production plant with a capacity of 4000 units, production of 4000 units, let's say, then at that, at 3000, you are experienced you're experiencing minimum cost per unit. But here if you see at 4,000 level, at 4,000 level the cost is starting to increase. Why would that be? That would be as a result of too many employees, too much production going on, right? So if you have too many employees to manage, too much production going on, you, experience, you start experiencing this economies of scales. So there's an optimum level of production that the company can do in a given situation. So in long run what happens is if you keep producing you would experience this economies of scale. So cost at different levels of production there's an optimum level that you need to see for reducing the cost to a minimum level. Also cost as a function of production experience as the time passes by and as the number of units that you produce increases, it reduces the per unit cost as a result of experience as well. How does experience reduces the cost? Because you're able to find out new efficient ways of working. Your labor becomes skilled. You are able to reduce time of producing products. As a and you're able to reduce the wastage that you incur in producing the product. So as a result of experience, as you increase the number of units produced, it reduces the cost per unit. <coughs> now what happens in cost, base, cost plus pricing, which is a cost based pricing? Cost plus pricing is a pricing technique where you add a standard markup to the cost of product. Right? So that the cost is rupee, rupees 10 or let's say the cost is rupees 100 for producing a particular product, you add a markup of 0.2%. Now that 0.2% would be your profit, right? So what would be 0.2%? Profit. No, of 100. That would be rupees 20, right? So 0.2% of 100 would be rupees 20. The price that you would offer the product on in the market would be 120. So the 100 would be cost recovery and the 20 would be profit. So that would be cost plus pricing. Now the biggest disadvantage of cost plus pricing is that it ignores the competitors, it, it ignores the demand of the product, right? So value based pricing takes it into account competitors, it takes into account the value that the customer would enjoy. Right? So this is something that is ignored in cost plus pricing. Now if you see here, these are the formulas of cost plus pricing. So you have total cost is equal, this is plus, I'm sorry, this is plus. So total cost, fixed cost plus variable cost, unit cost is variable cost plus um, fixed cost divided by unit sales and then markup is unit cost 1 minus desired return on sales. So if you, if you say unit cost was rupees 10, then what would be? Let's say if the unit cost turned out to be rupees 10, how would you add the markup? How much would that make? How much would that make? Hmm? 
12.5. So 12.5 would be the price at which you would offer the product into the market, right? So this is cost plus pricing. On the other hand, there is target profit pricing, which is based on break even. Break even. What is break even? Right. So a, pl a point where the revenue inter intersects with the cost, right? So that is target profit pricing. Now what happens in target profit pricing is, if you see here the graph, this sales volume on the x-axis and cost in dollar on y-axis. And this is the point where total revenue and total cost meet. So this is, this is break even, right? Let's say if your target cost or, or your target profit was $200,000. This is the profit that you would want to target. To get this particular target profit, how much units will you have to create? Now if you see here, this is 1,000 level, this is 800. And the difference between these is, is this, 2 lakh, right? So $1,000 minus, uh, 1,000 minus 800 is 200, right? So if you minus 1,200, that would be 200 um, at the moment. What, how much? Sorry. So that would be 2 lakh dollars. Now at what point do you think this particular target would be achieved? If you come down at 50,000, the total cost would be 800 at the total revenue would be 1,000 and the sales volume would be 50,000, right? So at 50,000 units, if you do 50,000, if you produce 50,000 units, you will be able to achieve your target profit, right? And at that target profit, that would define your target price, right? So what happens in this particular target profit pricing is determined to, uh, is designed to determine how many units we will need to sell to cover both the cost and achieve a profit. So if you see here, we have recovered the cost well here. At this particular point, the cost has been recovered, right? So when you reach the break, break even, that means the cost has been recovered. Anywhere above that would be profit, right? So all this region is the profit region. So if you go beyond that level, there is profit. So the cost has been recovered and your target profit is 2 lakh, right? At what point 2 lakh target profit could be achieved? At exactly this point. So the total revenue is 1 lakh. The total cost is 800 and the volume at the which you need to produce is 50,000 units. So that is break-even analysis and target profit pricing. Have a look at it and if there's a confusion, we'll, we'll try to do it again. So the first step in doing this would be you need to identify the break-even point, go beyond that break-even point set your target profit. Based on that target profit, see what is the revenue, total revenue, and what is the total cost. Come down and you'll be able to see the volume that you need to produce for achieving that target profit. Done? So let's do it one more time and see if Right, settle down. So this is a graph for break-even analysis and target profit pricing. What happens in this graph is the sales volume on x-axis and there is cost on y-axis. Now what happens here is you, um, you, you draw the graph of total revenue 
and then you draw the graph of total cost and the point where both of these intersect is your break even point. So what is your break even volume for um, for this particular scenario 30,000 units if you produce that means at 30,000 units the total cost would be is equals to the total revenue. So your break even vol sales volume is 30,000 units. Now you've targeted to a profit of $200,000. At what point, how many units would you have to sell to achieve that $200,000 profit? Now if you extrapolate, if you see here at 1,000 at this level, the total revenue is $1,000 and the total cost is 800. Now what is the profit formula? Profit formula is profit formula is total revenue minus total cost. So you minus the total revenue which is $100,000 and um, the cost is 800. So you minus those, what, you, what do you get? Two lakh dollars, which is your target profit, right? With this, we've come to the end of today's lecture. In the next class, we'll talk about the other factors that affect pricing and additional uh, decisions that you need to take when it comes to pricing the product. For your assignment, I want you to go home, give a read to Ryanair, case study that is in your book.